الله صلى الله عليه وسلم رسول الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله عليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته How are you doing? الحمد لله الحمد لله كيف الوضع؟ الحمد لله You have been here you haven't been here for quite some time yeah, it's because of the, obviously, it's good to, with arguments and mentalities and arguing with people daily affects your heart, you know. It gives you some hardness, hardness in your heart. So it's good to stay away from it once, every once in a while. And obviously the corona and, and the situation and everything is going on. So would you advise so. people not to listen to all these Islamophobic contents? Yeah, um, of course. I would, I would advise people to, there's a lot of Muslims who watch, watch these videos, right? And they watch it for, for the sake of entertainment and there is two types, two people are talking, two different perspectives. But if you wanna if you wanna listen to the opponent's perspective, first we should get our basis of Islam. If I have if I have an empty cup, right, and I fill it with pure water, whatever you add to it is gonna follow, right? But if you have an empty cup and you start adding two things into it, dirty and clear water, you will end up with water that is not pure so the muslims who, who have not even yet had the basis of islam right the the, the five the, they don't know the arcan of the salah for example the pillars of the prayer right they don't know the the five pillars of islam in detail they don't know the six articles of faith right they wouldn't know that the, the basic hadith of jibreel iman and ihsan and islam if they don't know the basis of islam yet right and they are coming to listen to people who have shubuha their heart what might. What do you mean by shubuhat? Shubuhat is those kind of Islamophobes that you rightly call them or refer to them, who come and, and misportray Islamic teachings. They look, uh, they find the hadith, they find the verse, they find something in Islam, and they take a part of it, they twist the scripture, they mistranslate the verse, in order for them to push people away from Islam. And something, something which is very unique, subhanAllah, which is that they never come talk about the religion. They never come and preach the religion. If I have like the conviction that my religion, my faith is true, wouldn't I come first and want to share it with others? Or would I first want to attack the religion that is my enemy or the religion that is actually offering something better than what I'm offering? If I'm not feeling threatened by Islam, why am I coming and attacking Islam rather than preaching my own religion? If you go look at their videos, they don't talk about Christianity. They don't talk about atheism if they're atheists. They don't talk about Hinduism if they're Hindu. But they want to oppose Islam. Why? Exactly. Brother Muhammad, I just found, um, even just a little while ago, someone asking me about, oh, what about this? Uh, the person was behind me shouting about this satanic versus event and so on. I find it strange how people are easily taken in by these doubts people are raising. Yeah and they want to know what's the issues and as if there's some truth in it. Do you see this is a, a pattern that is happening in, 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 in today's time where people are repeating lies and misinformation many, many times to make it to people as if there's some truth in it. Do you notice that? Yeah, yeah. it's, it's, it's what we call brainwashing, isn't it? And it's a, very, it's a tactic that happens uh, very often in the media where you have every channel repeating the same news, trying to brainwash the people into believing something is true. You know, when there is a lie and you keep repeating the lie, everyone is repeating the lie around you, they keep repeating it, you start believing it's true. And that's the tactic they're taking, right? Every, it, they go, they sit down around before coming here on a dinner or something, and then they repeat this lie with each other, this is what we're going to repeat today, and they go and repeat it to people. And even though you adequately, you, 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 you very, very, um, Deet, you give a detailed explanation of what they're asking about, next week they come with the same question. Which shows the reality is that you're not looking for an answer for that question. If you were looking sincerely for an answer, when we provide you with a detailed answer, that is the Islamic classical position with evidences, with references and everything, a sincere person would say, yeah, I agree. Next week I might bring some new question. Even if, if I want to waste my time basically for looking for questions, I will bring you questions. Yeah. But, the reality is, it's always the same questions. And subhanAllah, when you watch videos of yourself, for example, or other people, other speakers here, you find that pattern of the same questions every week. Answers being given, and people are not content. So I think it's, it's also the time for us as people who want to spread the message of Islam to pull ourselves away from these people, to completely boycott these people. That's why you don't see me having discussions with them. 
that we share our message of Islam to people as much as we can, which we do, alhamdulillah, every week. You want to say something? Yeah. yeah. So this is what our stance has been in the past, especially. Yeah. Because people often think, why are we not engaging with those critics of Islam, they're coming as if like they're roaming around the park and they've got the upper hand of like totally dismantling Islam. Um, this kind of complex that people are suffering is something, you know, what can I say? It's very, not very intellectual in its scope because we have debated and engaged in discussion with the same people many many times in this park over the years those of you those of you who want to go back and they go back to the videos that are in our channels um, you can go back and review the debates and the discussions and the engagements that we had with them and we have critiqued their criticism and shown them how it's unjustified, how it's invalid, and how it's weak and poor. And we have dismantled and defuted and debunked their arguments. It is something that has been done already. So when they bring up again, the same issue again, what's the point of dealing with them when they have relegated themselves to heckless? That's why we boycott them, we avoid them, because there's no sincerity left. Only thing that we see within them is hatred, is, is, is some kind of sarcastic behavior, behavior of someone who's not sane, because they're doing things which are totally, uh, you know, I, I, it's called a representation of insanity, okay? You do these things and you talk about our prophet, talk about our belief, talk about our book, in such a derogatory way, a sane person would not do that. If you're going to have a sane discussion, a discussion where intellectual exchange takes place, you wouldn't bring this up. I'm not going to start insulting your mother and then say, let's have a discussion about this. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 is, it is not the way to discuss. Mm -hmm. So we have left them. And so if the people are wondering why we don't engage with them, because what's the point of discussing with people who are not sincere? People who are not willing to engage in a discussion. Have they brought anything new? We've dealt with it already. We just need to go back. Go into the archives of those channels and you will see that we have already answered those questions and criticisms. So what I want to talk about today, if you don't mind, fine, we have all these criticisms around, right? How are we convinced as Muslims that Islam is true? How can one who is trying to become a Muslim, willing to become a Muslim, because they see the truth in there, what advice can we give them? So there's two questions. But as Muslims themselves, when all these criticisms come by, how can we be certain that Islam is indeed the truth? What way do you think Muslims should think in this matter? Of course, that's a big question you have to answer. Start with the first one yeah. about how do we become certain Islam is true? Yeah. I know it's a big question, but yeah. we need to mention it and lay it on the table why we feel that confidence mm -hmm. uh, in Islam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I will obviously talk about how I see my experience of it and, and my view of it, basically, of how I found Islam to be the truth or how can someone find Islam to be the truth. Well, something very unique about the Quran, they ask you to challenge it. It, it does, it's never, when you read the Quran, it's not a book that tells you, okay, believe in me and walk away. No, it actually it asks you to challenge it, right? Ponder upon these verses. We have revealed the Quran in order for you to ponder over it, right? And it makes claims, it makes falsification tests, right? There's two falsification tests in what the do you Quran. Mean by falsification test? Do you want to explain it first? Right? Okay, sure. The Quran has two challenges. Uh, each challenge challenges whoever reads the Quran. That if you don't believe the scripture is from God, falsify this challenge. Prove it to be wrong. Prove it false. Prove it false. Yes. So one of the challenges is that the Quran has no contradictions, which is a claim that other books doesn't make, as other religious books don't make. The Quran makes a claim that you will not find two clear statements that contradict each other in the Quran, even though it's revealed on 23 years. Many of it was circumstantial. People came asking Prophet Muhammad questions. He responded to their questions with revelation straight away. So he didn't have time to pre-think what he's gonna say, right? So it was instant what Prophet Muhammad was saying. And the Quran makes the claim that you will not find any contradictions within it. Because if a scripture is coming from God, by definition, by necessity, you cannot have a contradiction in it. So that links with your second question, right? What do you mean by contradiction? 
Contradiction is two clear statements we can, which cannot be reconciled. Logically, they cannot be reconciled. You have an example in mind that you can share us? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad was an Arab. Uh, Prophet Muhammad was European. You find two statements in the Quran. One claims that Prophet Muhammad is an Arab and one claims that Prophet Muhammad is European. You cannot reconcile between these two statements because by definition you're either an Arab or European, right? Caucasian. So therefore that is a contradiction that cannot be reconciled. So similarly, any contradiction that you can find like this, if you can find the contradiction like this in the Quran, the whole religion, the whole basis of the religion is falsified, right? And that's something unique. And as I was saying, if a scripture is from God, by necessity, it cannot have any contradictions, right? So, I was saying it links, which you will not go to the second question here, but it links with the second question. So if someone is trying to look to find the truth, he should look for a scripture that doesn't have contradictions, right? Because if it's from the creator, by necessity, it cannot have a contradiction, right? Now, the second challenge that the Quran offers is a challenge of imitation of the Quran. Imitate the Quran, the Quranic Arabic, bring something like the Quran, right? Obviously, there is bring 10 chapters like the Quran, bring a, a book like the Quran. There is multiple verses in the Quran which makes bring one chapter like the Quran, right? And it was gradual where Allah challenged the Meccan, Bedouin Meccan Arabs to produce something like the Quran. First, he told them bring a book like it. It was too much for them, obviously. Allah told them to bring 10 chapters. They couldn't. Allah told them to bring one chapter like the Quran. Obviously, there are material you can read about that in, in English and Arabic, I believe, about the, uh, the, uh, the challenge of the Quran when it comes to imitating the scripture, the inimitability challenge of the Quran. So these are two challenges that we would say gives the, the, the claim that the Quran is from God a lot of weight, right? Uh, especially if you are someone who understands the Arabic language, right? That will give you a lot of, uh, we would say, a lot of a push to can easily find out whether this book is from God or not, right? Now, you want to say something? Yeah. yeah. So, I just want to remind our audience who are listening, so, um, both myself and Brother Muhammad, we did a talk, three-part series, on this very issue of the Quranic challenge, uh, of its inimitability, of how the Quran cannot be imitated in the Arabic language, um, before, now, or even in the future, whatsoever. Um, and our discussion, our talk was uh, in English. You can find this in SC Dawa. Um, I understand it was called The Challenge of the Quran, uh, yeah. something along this I line. Believe, I believe so. Um, yeah. I highly recommend you watch and review and ponder on this because this uh, lecture that we gave, we gave in detail for you to understand the very nature of the challenge of the Quran. It is not a challenge which is to deal with aesthetics or some kind of beauty because this can be subjective. Yeah. We offered from scholarly um, works where the challenge is objective and the nature of the objective challenge was demonstrated through linguistic devices um, and we went through some of these things within this lecture. So please, um, we'll try to give you in the description, those of you watching later, uh, links to this to uh, a free part of this lecture. So very important to understand. So when you say um, about no one can produce something like it, that's one thing we can understand. Yeah. Are you saying even the Arabs themselves, they feel that way that when they read the Quran in the Arabic language, this is their mother tongue and they are able to bring something like it? Well, the unique, the unique thing about the Quranic challenge or the basically the prophetic miracles in general, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he looks at the people uh, that the Prophet has been sent to and what are they actually experts in? What do they know the best? And he brings them a, an evidence, a miracle of something that they can know themselves that someone cannot bring this because we're experts, right? Well, I'm, uh, if I'm a doctor and you do something that no one can do in medicine, I will know, right? Similarly, Allah brings the miracle of the nature that the people understand. So the people at the time, Prophet Muhammad, the Bedouin Arabs, they were, they were, they were, they were most knowledgeable in Arabic. They used to compete with, it, with each other in poetry. They actually used to battle each other with poetry. Uh, one tribe actually, they were refuted so badly that they had to change their name, right? In poetry, a poet refuted them so badly that they had to change their whole name, right? So it was something that the Arabs were elites in, right? And they had 
the tree where he hangs the best, the, their best poetry on it. So it was what they were experts in. So, so they Allah, would, they would hang this on the wall of the Kaaba. Yeah, they, they were known as muallaqat. Yeah, right? muallaqat. Yeah. So they used to hang these muallaqat, uh, the best poetry that they could find. They used to hang because obviously they believed that the. Uh, the Kaaba was holy in a, in a way or a shape or a form, obviously, because they had remnants of, of the religion of Abraham, right? So, just to come back to, I forgot the point yeah. I was saying. <laughs> so, anyway, so yeah. this is about the challenge of the Quran, the Arabs themselves. Yeah, yeah, the Arabs, yeah, yeah. So, the, the Arabs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought the Quran in Arabic language to challenge the Arabs. Now, you were asking me, even the Arabs themselves. Well, it's very unique that the Arabs, when they heard the Quran, and that's what, what an expert, how an expert would behave. When they heard the Quran, they knew that we, we cannot even try. There is no point of even trying. They knew that it's impossible for us to bring something like this. It's impossible for us to imitate because they were expert in the Arabic language, right? Some people today who, who bring some absurd things and they claim they're, they're trying to imitate the Quran. Like we have obviously Musaylim al kadhab who, who had this very elephant, very, very funny elephant. Al-Fil. Uh, yeah, al al It was very funny. Yeah, exactly. Which, which, yeah. Which a child would laugh. Yeah, 100%, 100%, 100%. And, and that shows that he knew that he cannot produce something substantial. He could not give something that is actually challenging the Quran. There, there, therefore, in the end, he decided to do something absurd. He decided to mock as someone who is defeated would do, obviously, right? So the Arabs themselves submitted to the Quran, right? Therefore, we find majority of Arabs today still, right? Submitting to the nature of the Quran. Any Arab who listens to the Quran, right? He understands the divine nature of this book, right? Just by listening to it. You don't even need to go to, to the challenges, right? Because we believe the Quran itself is literally the words of the Creator, which is something that are even, even our non-Arab listeners can do. They can go online, they can type Quran, a recitation of the Quran, just simply on YouTube and listen to it. Try to see how, how does it make you feel, right? What effect, do, what effect does it have on you, right? Because we believe everyone has the fitrah, and the fitra is a concept of an innate connection with you and your creator and recognizing your creator and knowing what is right and wrong in the, in the basic things like, like killing, raping, and stealing and otherwise, right? So when you listen to the Quran, your fitra can feel it, right? Which is something that uh, if someone is a non-Muslim or a non-Arabic speaker can try and listen to the Quran, right? They should listen to the Quran that is being recited. Yes, in Arabic, even if they don't understand it, they, could, they should just try to listen to it, right? So to answer your questions, yes, the Arabs admitted their defeat. In fact, the Arabs praised the Quran, right? Uh, um, uh, this, is, this, this was one of the biggest poets of the time. And he said that it rises and nothing rises above it. And when he went to his people, he was going to test Prophet Muhammad. They, they brought one of the best poets of the time, the, the Bedouin Meccans, the non-believers. And they said to him, go to Prophet Muhammad and test. See what this man is bringing, you know. So he went, he listened. And when he came back to his people, he said, this is not the words of man. He said, this rises, nothing rises above it. And he said, I'm a poet. I'm expert in poetry. This by no way can be something of a human being. So that was the reaction of people who were born to believe in idols, were on the religions. Uh, it was Al Walid ibn al Mughira. Walid ibn al Mughira was one of the best poets of the time. So the, the, the Bedouin Arabs, the Meccans, the believers have brought Al Walid ibn al Mughira to test Prophet Muhammad sallallahu And he's the one who prays. He said, Right. So he was one of the best poets of the time. So that was the Arabic reaction to the Quran. And something that anyone can do, and they can go to scholarly work of Arabs that are non Muslim. Who would you wrote? Not say it's hmm. not really a fair challenge because they don't know Arabic language. Does the Quran somehow be, be, has become somehow unfair to them because they don't know Arabic language? How can they meet the challenge if they don't know the Arabic language? Or does well, the Quran offer something? Well, that would refer back to our lecture, obviously, which has, has the criteria that we, we have set forward, obviously, which anyone can do. But another answer as well would be that not all the Arabs are Muslims. And the reality is, if you claim that the only Arabs are saying this, you should go to an un-Muslim Christian Arab, you should go to an un-Muslim Jewish Arab, you should go to an whatever his religion is, and he's an Arab, and you should ask him to produce something like the Quran. Because the Quran does say, um, 
بسوره البقره yeah. رأيتم في رجل ما نزلنا على عبدنا فأتوا بصورة من مثله ودعوا شهداءكم من دون الله إن كنتم صادقين ودعوا شهداءكم من دون الله So call your witnesses So that means those people who can support you go to you know Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard or wherever they might be who are experts in the language and ask them of their opinion Professors in Arabic language people who are qualified in the language and Allah, yeah, this is chapter 2 verse 23. Allah also says in the Quran that قُلْ لَإِنْ اِجْتَمَعَتِ الْإِنسُ وَالْجِنُّ عَلَىٰ اَنْ يَأْتُوا بِمِثْلِ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ لَا يَأْتُونَ بِمِثْلِ You know, if an Arab listens to this, you know, to him, what you feel when you listen to the Quran. وَلَوْ كَانَ بَعْضُهُمْ لِبَعْضُ اللَّهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if the Jinn kind and, and humans, jinn kind is a different creation that we believe in as Muslims. We cannot see them, they can see us, all right? They're metaphysical beings. Allah said if they all gathered, humans and jinn kind, to produce something like the Quran, Allah says, لا يأتون بمثله. They will never be able to do it now, in the future or ever. So Allah makes another challenge there, right? The Quran is full of challenges, obviously. This is one other challenge that Allah says, even if they all supported each, each other. So Allah is not saying everyone is working individually. Allah is saying, gather, support each other, bring everyone and produce something like the Quran. And that challenge has been here for 1,400 years. If someone could bring something like the Quran, we would have seen it by now. But those who are experts in the field have already submitted to it. For knowing that the Quran is, by definition, the best thing you can have in Arabic language, which is inimitable, the highest literature. Just to give you additional examples for people to appreciate what we mean by the linguistic plan. Suppose I was an engineer, construction engineer, and I make buildings. Okay? And you are an engineer too. Yeah. Uh, so are you. And I say, look, I have made or constructed the building. You cannot make such a building ever, now or even later. You cannot make a building like mine. Yeah. And you'd say, why not? You know, I'm as good as you are in, in construction and engineering. I should be able to make a building. I mean, we are both qualified and both experts and we are proficient in, in our field. I say, here, here is my building. You see my building there? Every brick is not touching every other big brick of that building. It's made of bricks, of course, and cemented, but you can see if you go closely inspect it, you can put a, something all around it. The bricks are floating in space, every single brick of that building. So it's a 20 story building like that. And this is how they are standing as a structure. Every brick floating on top of side of each other without touching each other. Can you make a building like that? Impossible. Can you? At least with our technology today, we can. Not with this technology, you can't. Yeah. Yeah. So when the Quran brings this challenge and says, bring something like it, you know, to be mislihi. And just la yatuna bi mithli. They would not bring something like it at all. They cannot bring like the Quran. So we are talking about the Quran came in the Arabic language with the Arabic alphabet. Same words. Noon. Wal qalami wa ma yasturun. Same Arabic letters, Arabic words, sentences constructed in Arabic. Yet the way they are constructed in the linguistic genre that is the Quran, it is impossible for them to match. So please watch those. Um, series um, without making it any longer. Yeah. This is where you will understand why people are still unable to meet this challenge of the Quran. Yeah. And this indeed, would you not agree, is the primary challenge of the Quran? It is, yeah. Sure. It is. But you mentioned something about contradictions. Yeah. When Allah says, um, وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ بِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَا وَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا yeah. What if somebody says, this Quran says you cannot find more than two ikhtilafan. What if they find another word called ikhtilaf in the Quran, then they found more than one? Yeah. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where he says, uh, if it was from other than Allah, you'll find any, many discrepancies, contradictions, chapter 4, verse 82 of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word ikhtilafan only once, which is, it's not only mind blowing that, that Allah could use two or three or four different words of ikhtilaf which, which someone would say you're being silly that the Quran is actually talking about a real contradiction which two statements that oppose each other but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word once which shows like as I said to you when you look at how the Quran was revealed 
and it was on 23 years of circumstantial. When you think about it this way, you don't think of the Quran as a book that was given, written someone who sat down for 60 years of his lifetime, who was checking every word. No, Prophet Muhammad, when he gave us the Quran, majority of it was circumstantial. That's why you need uh, the, the exegesis of the Quran and the history to understand many of the events that are there because they're circ circumstantial, right? Allah says, just aluna ka'an ruh they ask you about the ruh, the soul, right? Say, the soul is from the affairs of my Lord. This is a verse in the Quran and Prophet Muhammad answers with the revelation when he was asked a question, right? And if you construct uh, a something that you telling other people they cannot construct something like it, you wouldn't do it in two seconds, would you? You will not wait, the person is asking you a question and you just give him a statement and then you say, bring something like it later on. You would say, okay, give me five, 10 days where I actually construct the verse that you cannot imitate because there is a challenge that would be in the future. So when you put things in that perspective, it gives you a lot to think about that the Quran is not, people shouldn't look at it as abstract as it is. They should look also on how long the Quran was revealed and the circ circumstantial as aspect of it and all of these things, it gives the claim a much higher weight, I would say. Okay. Yeah. So what if somebody said, maybe he learned poetry and learned the art of this linguistic genre and made it himself. Yeah. Maybe you know, he had teachers that taught him. Yeah. Well, the, the unique thing, as we were saying in the beginning about the Quran, it, it, it actually tells you to ask questions, right? So these questions are already foretold in the Quran, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he already puts these kind of, of, of claims. He says, Prophet Muhammad, as for those who don't know, obviously, uh, was illiterate, he couldn't read or write. So Prophet Muhammad could Explain not... Explain what do you mean by illiterate? Illiterate, he couldn't read or write. Meaning that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he lived with his people for, for 40 years. They know him, they know everything about his life. He could not read letters or write letters, Arabic letters himself. In fact, uh, a lot of the historians say that in Mecca, there was only seven literate people, people who can read or write. So it was a common thing as well in Mecca. So Prophet Muhammad was illiterate. His people knew that he was illiterate. They lived with him. He did not live in a spaceship alone. People actually lived with him. So they knew he didn't le learn how to read or write. So Allah says, if he knew how to read or write, people will say that he brought it from himself. But the fact is, even if he brought it from someone, or even if he made it up himself, why you can't imitate it? Precisely. I mean, if some other teachers taught him, they would have said, look, why are you taking all the credit? I taught yeah. you. Yeah. And now you're saying it is all. I mean, this is the common thing today, isn't it? You pass on someone's ideas and you say, this is mine, and then you'll be faulted for plagiarism. Yeah. Because you've taken someone else's work. Yeah. So if, if the Quran really affected the Arabian society and overturned their status quo, and apparently there were some teachers of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they would come forward and say, I taught you that. Yeah. But no one came forward. Yeah. In fact, instead they were saying, okay, okay, this is not a statement of a human being. Yes. They, they succumbed to this, they, they actually submitted and surrendered. Mm -hmm. That was the time. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to ikhtilafan, um, there are contradictions. Um, could it be just guesswork that he just made it and it doesn't contradict? Uh, you know, was he calculating somehow and then was he like planning things when he instructed what he says? Um, and that's why he made it so coherent. Did, 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 did he not do the Quran like maybe you know two weeks or three weeks? When did he finish the Quran? How long was it? Yeah. Well, the Quran was revealed on on a period of twenty three years. Okay, so it's right? twenty three years. Yes. Not few weeks. Yeah, twenty three years, and the Quran uh, used to be revealed in Ramadan as well, and it used to be revealed circumstantially, as we said. The people come to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they ask him a question yeah. and the Prophet just answers with revelation. Therefore, if you, if you are someone who is actually seeking not to have a, a contradiction, because a lot of people, they say, you can make a book today, you don't have any contradictions, right? You can write a book today with no contradictions, it's an easy thing to do. But can you do that with a revelation you had on 23 years that was circumstantial, that you didn't have control over many of it, right? That when it was being revealed, that you didn't play with the words, put words here, take words there. It was not in your hand to do that. In fact, there is a beautiful verse in the Quran that says that those who disbelieve tell Prophet Muhammad bring another Quran other than this or change it. And Prophet Muhammad's response is, it wasn't for me to do it. 
This is a revelation I'm getting. So if I'm worried about a mistake, I would change the book, right? But Prophet Muhammad is saying, this is a revelation to me from my creator. I have no choice to take or put, add or submit or to do anything. All I have to do is submit to my creator and give you the revelation I'm receiving from the creator. So, so this should give us some idea of how the Quran itself acts yeah. as the divine source of origin yeah. of its authenticity, yeah. that the Quran is from God. Yeah. Um, what would you tell the people who are willing to become a Muslim and yeah. they understand that this is the case, but there are something still they have questions and, and, and stopping them from becoming a Muslim? Yeah. Because if this is the nature of the Quran yeah. and no one can disagree really looking at it, then the Quran has to be from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens and the earth, from the yeah. cosmos, because yeah. you can't bring something like it. The way it describes the past, present and the future, it unfolds the events that will happen. It talks about history that was not known. It challenges people and it gives you information of the unseen and it even predicts things that a, a normal person cannot. To give you an example, when Allah talks about in a surah, surah to, Al-Masad, isn't it? Allah had yada bi Habi wa tab you know, perish the hands of Abu Lahab. Mm -hmm. And in this surah, Allah says how he and his wife, both because of their disobedience and their uh, rejection of God, of course, that they will end up, you know, the fire carriers of hellfire and they will be in hell. But these people lived for more than 10 years after this revelation came, yeah. right? After this chapter was, uh, surah was revealed. Yeah. How did Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa or the author of the Quran, whoever he is, if he wasn't God, right? Mm -hmm. If he wasn't Allah, know that this person, even as a hypocrite, will not come out and say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, and say, I become a Muslim. That means now you can't say I'm going to go to hellfire. Yeah. How did someone know, and they will live for 10 years, and something prevents them mm -hmm. from accepting Islam? Mm -hmm. This Wasn't this a golden opportunity to destroy Islam? Mm -hmm. Of course. So, there are various things that um, in the Quran does point to of its divine authenticity and origin, mm -hmm. but the people who are still like almost there, but there's something that's stopping them. What advice would you give? Because there are a lot of people out there, we know, a lot of people out there, they see the truth of Islam. Mm -hmm. They want to become a Muslim, mm -hmm. but still something is preventing them. I mean, what advice can you give? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something beautiful in the Quran to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, Innaka la tahdi man ahbat, walakin Allah yahdi man yasha. That you don't guide those whom you like, whom you love, whom you want to guide. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He guides whom He wills. So I would say to anyone who is sincere, who's done his research, and he finds any reasons not to be a Muslim that are not logical. It's not of, of logical nature. It's not of, of, of a question, query nature rather of something else, first to ask the Creator. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he taught us to put our forehead on the floor when we pray. Mm -hmm. And he says to us, when you do that, you are the closest to your Lord. You are the closest to your Creator. So I will urge all these people. And first I want to ask them, have you ever asked... You can speak to them directly. I'm sure yeah. other people are watching. Yeah, of course. Have you ever felt sincerely on your face and asked the Creator to guide you? Sincerely, we are saying now that you ignored everyone, you ignored everything, you sat down alone in your, in your room where no one is there except yourself, and you asked the creator of the, heaven, the heavens and the earth to guide you. And if they haven't done that, this is what we're offering them to do, right? This is the first and most important thing because ultimately, Allah has 99 names and attributes. One of them is Al-Hadi, he's the one who guides, right? He is the one who guides people into Islam or into anything. Allah says, whom Allah wants to guide, He opens His heart to Islam. So, whoever is sincere, ask the Creator. Now, if your questions are of a logical nature, of a query nature, we recommend this, and this is very important to be stressed out. Don't go ask a layman Muslim. Go ask someone who is qualified. If, if I have an issue, right? If I have a, 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 a heart disease, I will go to a cardiologist. I will not go to a dentist and ask him, can you, can you fix this issue? My heart is feeling yeah, like this. No disrespect to a dentist. Um, yeah, of course, yeah, of course. So you will go to the specialized person in the field. So we say to, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have Muslim friends, right? Do not go to your Muslim friend, rather go to someone who is qualified in Islam. 
someone who have dealt with these questions, who, who understands what to do and what not to do, right? And we're here every Sunday, right? Almost every Sunday, you will find one of us in here. And we're very happy to answer any questions. If any of you have a sincere question, just come. Uh, look for us and say, I have a question, I have a sincere question, I want to learn about Islam. So anyone who has a question of a query nature so should come to a knowledgeable person, someone who understands the religion of Islam, who has some understanding of it, and he asks him, and he will get his answers. And this is my experience with Islam. Every time you dig deep into the religion, it convinces you more. Every time you have a question, you will find a sufficient answer, if you're sincere. And that's what I would say to everyone who is willing to accept the religion. Investigate, investigate, search, research what we said, watch the lectures. And in the end, when you feel you're ready, take the step. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us also in the Quran that as Muslims, we believe in, 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 in uh, the Creator, which is the good force as well. And we believe that there is an evil force in this world, which we refer to as the devil, right? And the devil has no, no control over humans from the sense that he makes you do something. What he can do is to give you ideas. So if they have ideas, which are things not of a logical nature, they should try to sit down with themselves, bring a piece of paper and say, why am I not a Muslim? And list the reasons. And I'm sure that this will be a very useful exercise for you to do. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. What if somebody is afraid because they've done so many wrong things in their lives? Yeah. And they think God would never forgive them. Yeah. That's a very, very beautiful and common thing that a lot of people, very beautiful question. And it's a common thing that people, people come with usually, right? And, you know, we, we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a lot of names and attributes, right? And... He, when you read the first chapter of the Quran, the first verse and the third verse repeats two attributes of the Creator that Muslims read 17 times a day. And these are Ar Rahman and Rahim, which both come from one root, which is Rahman, mercy. So these two words, obviously, you will find in the lecture the meaning of these two words, right? In detail. But they're both coming from the mercy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has other names. Al Ghafur is the one who pardons, right? Al Afu is the one who forgives. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. Other attributes like al wadud the excessively loving. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is excessively loving, He is merciful. So Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al Zumur, He says that, Say, O oh, you who have set, transgressed against yourselves in sins, says, know, So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh my servants who have transgressed against yourselves. So Allah is not referring to, to, and this is a very beautiful verse in Arabic. Allah is not referring to those who made one or two mistakes, three mistakes here and there, four mistakes here and there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about those who have transgressed against themselves and sinning. They have done unspeakable things, right? And Allah calls them my servants. Allah doesn't call them, oh, you bunch of, of, of evildoers, you, you snakes, you, you this, you that. Allah says, oh, my servants, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives all sins. Come to me. Come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the beautiful thing is that when a person becomes a Muslim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives all his previous sins. He says in this ayah, La taqnatun mi rahmatillah. Yeah. Do not despair. Do not despair of the mercy of Allah. Of Allah. Yeah. So that Allah forgives all sins. Don't feel, don't even think and imagine that yeah. Allah is not going to forgive you because you've done all things wrong. Allah is making it clear and open to you. That yeah. Whatever you have done, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. He forgives yeah. all sins. Yes. And, and another very, very important point is this, which I usually ask people. Can you ever become perfect? Can you be perfect? Can any human being become perfect? A lot of people, they believe Islam is the truth, as you said, right? And they say the reason is what you said, but they say, I want to first fix myself. Now we say to these people that I make a lot of sins, I make a lot of mistakes, and every Muslim does. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Kullu ibn Adam khatta. Every child of Adam makes mistakes, makes sins. Right? And the best of those who make sins and mistakes are the ones who repent. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that everyone makes mistakes, everyone makes sins. So if you're waiting to become perfect before you become Muslim, that was never going to happen. Because no one is perfect. You have shortcomings, you have mistakes, everyone has shortcomings, everyone has mistakes. Take the step today, 
before you don't have a chance to take the step. So if you become a Muslim, does your sin still carry on accumulated or...? All the previous sins that you've done in your past, like Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu told us, that the Islam removes everything of evil, of sins, before it. SubhanAllah, so Allah washes away all your sins and forgives them. Not only that, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, that if you repent and you start practicing doing good deeds, Allah will turn all those evil deeds into good deeds. But it doesn't stop there. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi told us something very beautiful. He said that the person who becomes Muslim, the previous good deeds that he did are still there. So you were not Muslim, you were doing a good deed. Allah will not deny you that deed you did even as a non-Muslim. So Allah, this shows the mercy and love of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that he wants to give to his servants and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is offering every single one of you who is willing to accept this beautiful religion of Islam. So what, are you waiting for? Yeah. what are you waiting for? You know in your heart, you know in your mind, spiritually, intellectually, reasonably, Islam is the truth. Do not make these obstacles, you know, these ethnic differences, differences of morality, of presentism, differences of your language, of your color, as an obstacle to accept Islam. If Islam is true and your heart and your mind and your soul knows it, embrace it and come to Islam wholeheartedly before it's too late because one day sooner or later we're going to die and we don't want to die in a state of disbelief in our Lord and our Creator. We want to die in a state of submission to our Creator that we indeed have submitted our souls, ourselves our body and our mind to our Creator who created us to thank Him, to glorify Him, to show Him gratitude. And if we can do that, then we know the promise of God, promise of Allah is true, that He has prepared for us paradise, Jannah, Jannah Adn. He has produced for us Garden of Eden, where is this eternal bliss, eternal tranquility and happiness. And moreover, He will save us from the fire of hell. Oh people, fire of hell is a reality, it's not a joke. Fire of hell, the fuel of fire is stones and human beings. Human beings are used to fuel the fire. So we don't want to be the fuel of the fire, we want to be saved. Allah says, Successful are those who have purified themselves. Purity from worshipping the creation. Purifying yourself from worshipping your own desires. Purifying yourself from worshipping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Worshipping Him alone. So if you can do that, Allah has guaranteed. He says, Wa'd. He gives the word. The word He uses, Wa'd Allah ladina amanu. Or he's, He uses the word, Allah promises that He will give you paradise under which rivers flow. So it is not a mere condition that, yeah, if you do this, Allah actually promises us. Chapter 4, verse says, 122. Allah, yukhlif yes. He does not break his promise because Allah is truthful, Allah is just, and He promised us that if we believe and do the works of righteousness, then He will give us this paradise. Mm -hmm. So, people, before it's too late, do this introspection. Wake up to this spiritual and intellectual awakening. Forget about this life and its illusions. They are only a means to distract you. But we don't say you forget altogether. We say you live in this life for the better of this life, but also for better of the hereafter. We say, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al nar. O our Lord, give us the good in this life and the good in the hereafter. Wa qina adab al nar. And save us from the fire of hell. So we wish and we pray and we hope and we ask everyone and we ask Allah overall subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you and give us the hidayah, the guidance to come to the worship of Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And we hope that you Amen. take this as a message of importance and you take this as a message of priority that you save yourself from this hellfire which is eternal and you embrace Allah's paradise, which is eternal. So thank you indeed for joining us in this discussion that we had. And I thank you Jazakallahu khairan, for explaining beautifully and eloquently and making it simple for people to understand. Um, and we hope that 
Allah guides those who sincerely ask His guidance. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.